This video will investigate the pathophysiology of placental abruption, timestamps for epidemiology, placental anatomy, risk factors, pathophysiology, and signs and symptoms have been provided. Placental abruption. Placental abruption is characterized by premature separation of the placenta during pregnancy. Placental abruption most commonly occurs during the second half of pregnancy and is the most common cause of bleeding during the second and third trimester. In terms of epidemiology, placental abruption will affect approximately 1% of all pregnancies and is a significant cause of perinatal morbidity and mortality. In terms of specific onset, placental abruption most commonly occurs in patients who are 20 weeks or greater gestation, with peak onset occurring at 20 weeks and falling rapidly as we enter the third trimester of pregnancy. In order to understand the pathophysiology behind placental abruption, it's important that we review the layers of tissue that are going to make up the placenta and the maternal tissues beneath the placenta. When the blastocyst forms, it's going to implant into the endometrium, and the layer below that is going to become the decidua basalis. The decidua basalis is the layer of tissue in which we're going to see remodeling of the uterine arteries or spiral arteries in order to form the maternal side of placental circulation. In terms of the placenta itself, fetal circulation is going to branch off the umbilical arteries and vein, creating an area of diffusion in which the blood flow does not actually touch. If we take a closer look at the placenta and the decidua basalis, we can see what's happening in a placental abruption. We have the remodeled spiral arteries which are going to make up maternal circulation, and they're coming close to but not connecting with the chorionic villi that contain the fetal circulation. In placental abruption, maternal circulation within the decidua basalis is disrupted. As a result, we begin to have bleeding from this maternal circulation and the accumulation of blood within the decidua basalis. As this blood accumulates, it begins to put pressure on the placenta, pushing the placenta and the chorionic villi away from the decidua basalis and effectively detaching the placenta from the maternal tissue. In terms of causation of placental abruption, a number of risk factors exist. The two most highly correlated causes of placental abruption include chronic hypertension with preeclampsia, as well as cocaine and sympathomimetic use. Chronic hypertension and preeclampsia, as well as cocaine and sympathomimetic use, are highly related to decreased vessel integrity, as well as consistent vasoconstriction. As a result, as a result both are likely to lead to weak vessels that are under high pressure and more likely to rupture. A number of additional factors exist that have lower correlation with placental abruption, but also lead to an increased chance of vessel weakening and rupture. Cigarette smoking is closely related with placental abruption, and the number of cigarettes smoked during pregnancy proportionally increase the chances of placental abruption. Other maternal factors such as multiple gestation, multiparity, the presence of moderate to severe preeclampsia, and chorion amnionitis, an infection of the chorion or amniotic sac, lead to a moderate increase in the chance of developing placental abruption. Finally, oligohydroanimos, or deficiency in the production of amniotic fluid, has a low correlation to placental abruption but is a potential risk factor. Each of these factors are important as they lead to changes in the vasculature that increase susceptibility to rupture during an episode of vasospasm. Three core vascular changes are going to lead to this susceptibility during vasospasm. First, factors like chronic hypertension with preeclampsia, cocaine and sympathomimetic use, and cigarette smoking put patients at higher risk of chronic or acute vasoconstriction. As a result, blood is going to be under higher pressure and higher turbulence as it flows through the maternal vessels, increasing the potential of vessel wall destruction and rupture. Second, each of the factors listed increase the potential for fibrosis or scarring of the endothelial tissue. As a result, the integrity of the endothelial wall is damaged and the amount of space for blood flow is decreased. This will lead to an increase in turbulence of blood flow and again can further increase the pressure in which the vessel is under, leading to potential rupture. Finally, many of the factors listed here increase the chance of inflammation of the vessel, leading to a further decrease in integrity and again a higher chance of rupture. Overall, the risk involved in these factors is that the maternal circulation found in the decidua basalis is going to rupture, leading to accumulation of blood. As blood accumulates within the decidua basalis, we're going to see an increase in pressure, which will lead to ripping and tearing forces, which can destroy the decidua basalis while also pushing the placenta away from the maternal tissues. This can be visualized here as we see the bleeding increasing within the decidua basalis, actually pushing that placenta away from the uterine wall. The separation of the placenta from maternal circulation has some serious consequences. As it's the maternal circulation in the decidua basalis that's rupturing, maternal hemorrhage is a significant consequence of placental abruption. Secondly, as the placenta separates from the maternal circulation, the fetus becomes deprived of oxygen and nutrients. 
This oxygen and nutrient deprivation can lead to intrauterine growth restriction or can lead to fetal death. The mother is also at risk of death if the bleed is not controlled as disseminated intravascular coagulation or hemorrhagic shock can occur. Finally, due to the loss of adequate circulation, the placenta is at risk of ischemia. This ischemia is particularly dangerous because the placenta contains a number of clotting factors. As the placenta becomes necrotic, these clotting factors can be released into the bloodstream, increasing clotting and further impacting disseminated intravascular coagulation. A number of signs and symptoms are related to placental abruption, the most common being a painful vaginal bleeding or spotting. In placental abruption, the bleeding can either be concealed or apparent. In concealed bleeding, despite hemorrhage within the decidua basalis beneath the placenta, the edges of the placenta remain intact. As a result, they essentially pin the placenta to the edges of the maternal circulation, trapping the hemorrhage within the decidua basalis. With an apparent placental abruption, one of the edges of the placenta are fully removed from the maternal tissues, allowing for blood to leak out into the uterine space and exit through the vagina. As a result, a concealed abruption is most commonly related to little, no, or only spotting in terms of vaginal bleeding. If there is blood, it's likely to be dark red or clotted, and the patient may have unexplained hypotension or anemia. As blood can flow freely from an apparent hemorrhage, we're more likely to see bright red bleeding, and the amount of blood is likely to be increased compared to our concealed hemorrhage. However, it is important to note that the amount of bleeding is not necessarily correlated to the degree of the hemorrhage, as in concealed hemorrhage, some of this bleeding may remain within the decidua basalis, not exiting the placenta. Vaginal bleeding will most commonly be associated with abdominal pain or cramping, and this is because as we start to see an increase in blood building up in the decidua basalis, that blood is going to increase pressure on the surrounding tissues, leading to stretching and tearing and activation of nerve fibers. Stretching and tearing can also lead to the activation of stretch receptors within the uterus, leading to the onset of high frequency and low amplitude contractions. As the uterus contracts, it may become hard and tender on palpation. Due to the stress and lack of oxygenation for the fetus, you may see heart rate abnormalities such as decelerations, bradycardia, or reduction in variability. Finally, the stress placed on the fetus can lead to a release of CRH, which when combined with the onset of high frequency and low amplitude contractions can lead to premature labor. Finally, fetal asphyxia is common as bleeding worsens, which can lead to stillbirth.